Greetings all, Dean Disability here. This is my follow-up video to last week's, and because YouTube loves list content, I'm putting it in a nice, easy-to-reference top 10 things I did now a couple weeks ago to defuse the hazardous player trapper situation that my previous video talked about. So if you haven't seen it, by all means, you know, like, share, watch this video, and subscribe while you're here, and go back and watch the previous weeks, and this video will make a bit more sense. So, number one, the first thing I did, I put them in an impossible situation to begin with, and I was willing to admit that I put the players in what I now viewed as an impossible situation, and we had to rectify this in some way, shape, or form. I immediately then went into, you guessed it, step two. I broke the fourth wall. I let the players know, hey, this might be an impossible situation. I will follow the rules as needed here. However, let's talk this out. Let's even the playing field. Let's break the fourth wall, put the game on pause, not throw a sand timer or anything egregious up, and let the players and DM talk it out as players and DM, not as kind of characters in the situation. Make sure they understand the gravity of the situation and what is about to happen. Lay out all of the risks. In the instance of the trappers, I worked out the damage for them since Osric recommends a fixed damage system as opposed to rolling for damage so I could tell the party, hey, you, Mr. Fighter, are going to take 17 points of damage this turn. You, Thief, are going to take 11 points of damage this turn and you all will suffocate within the next six turns. Well, six rounds, technically. Lay out that information and make sure they understand that tension. It does not take away from the game. Now, this gets into my third point, which is to give excess information. I let them know, as an example, that the trapper is immune to damage from the inside. Okay, right? This is something... I don't think many DMs would, in fact, have done. They would have let the party flail for a turn or two, struggle, try and stab at, beat at this trapper from the inside. Now, much like how when I turn to a player and say they try and turn undead and they fail their role and cannot turn undead, the moment another character goes to say turn undead, I inform them that this other character just failed you probably can't turn the undead. I'm not saying they can't, right? But what I am informing them is information that the character might be able to pick up on that the player is not picking up on. And in the instance of a stone-hard thing crushing you to death and stopping you from moving, giving them the excess information of, I probably can't damage this thing, is no different from their character going, well, I can't move to reach my dagger, and I don't feel like I could probably hurt this thing given the current situation anyway. So sometimes giving this excess information can actually be very useful. A, it saves time, and B, it saves some frustration of having your players go, I do a thing, and then I go, it doesn't work. And then they go, I do a thing, and then I go, it doesn't work. So I give excess information in an attempt to limit that. However, number four, I let them know I am open to solutions. As an example with the trapper problem, let them know that they can use magic items or that they could, say, drink potions or that people from the outside could do something. Now, they still had to have those options, and indeed some players did not, which led them to simply go, well, I'm stuck relying on X, Y, and Z. I'm stuck relying on Momi. I'm stuck relying on the human fighter Django, who is outside and getting ready to wail on this thing with his giant dancing magical club of magicalness. So I let them know that I was open to various solutions, not just shutting them down. When they give you ideas, you have to then consider point number five in this list, which is express support of those players and their ideas. If the idea is not going to work, maybe present a counter option that might work that's building upon that, the yes and sequence or yes or sequence, right, that comes with improv acting. 
but let them know that you are not just open to solutions, that also you support their ideas and are willing to help them make it work, such as the party magic user in the instance of the trapper being able to drink a potion of fly in that first round and float out before the trapper effectively closes around the party. So after you've expressed support of at least their ideas or let your party know you are open to ideas, I'd recommend being cognizant of point six, which is to not get upset if you have party members that get upset. This goes for not just those who have disabilities, cognitive or otherwise, but also those other players, right? Some players do not handle having their characters put in impossible situations very well at all. And if you have players getting upset, it is very easy if, say, somebody else gets upset for you then to get upset. So don't let that ruin your fun and don't let that get to you. They're not necessarily mad at you. They're mad at the situation. They could be mad at you. They could even sound mad at you. And this is probably very true, at least temporarily. But the hope is that as adults, we all realize that at the end of the situation, we are not mad at the person, right? We are mad at either A, the decisions that were made, the dice rolls that were made, or more importantly, we are mad at the situation that happened to begin with. Which leads to number seven. We must be patient. We must give players time to think. Don't pressure them into an impossible situation and then say, okay, you have 30 seconds, what are you doing? This tends to lead players to shut down. Now, I am rather infamous, I guess, as a DM for limiting people to 60 second turns to where I will get out an egg timer specifically for that and saying, this is how much time you have left. But I only do that after they have already taken longer than 60 seconds. And if they don't know what to do or, or are unsure, and we are genuinely waiting on them, whether they've been distracted or they're fried or they can't make up their mind. And typically for me as a DM, that is a last resort choice. I do things like recap the situation, refocus things on that player, remind them to ignore the other players and the other characters, and ask them what they are doing. They control their character's action. And in a stressful situation like this, we sometimes have to remind the players that it's okay, they have time to think. Maybe you can simply just say, hey, I'm going to go, you know, grab another piece of pizza, go grab a drink, Take five minutes, talk about it amongst yourselves, brainstorm, and give them a general time where they can zoom out in effective bullet time and try and come up with some sort of plan or strategy. And then, at the end, we must turn our attention to number eight, which is be willing to kill characters. At the end of the day, once you've been as fair as possible, once you've leveled the playing field, once you've given them additional information, once you've broken the fourth wall, answered their questions, listened to possible solutions, supported the plausible ideas, sometimes, you know, sometimes the game just doesn't go the way your players want. Sometimes the dice giveth, sometimes the dice taketh away. And in the end, that's what happens. Be willing to have characters die. I was willing to have many characters die, or else I wouldn't have included that trap to begin with. I wouldn't have included that creature to begin with. I enjoy having a game that's relatively deadly. But once you've taken these previous steps, it's a deadliness that comes across as being fair, that comes across as not being arbitrary, that comes across as being acceptable. A fair comp, in other words, to use the old phrase. So, what happens then? Well... Once this big climactic event has resolved itself, one way or another, if the characters succeed, great. If some succeed and others do, okay. If they're all dead, once again, not great, but okay. Be willing to live with it. Take into consideration number nine, which is to take a break if needed. Tell your players, hey, that was a very stressful situation. That was a scary fight. This was a scary moment. Everybody take five, regardless of whether or not you need it. Take five, step away, have a cup of tea, whatever, talk amongst yourselves, and break game. Just hard pause and let people's emotions come down, especially if they were just upset and doing something like, oh, I don't know, threatening to throw a rock's glass at your head. Hi, Bill. I do that every so often. 
Okay. So once you take a break, once you step away, right, resume the game, and then we'll look at point number 10 here, my final point for the day, which is to check in at the end of the game. Ask people, now that they've had some time to reflect on it, they've had some distance, tempers have calmed down, characters are either going to A, be resurrected, or B, be left in the ground dead. Have them consider their options. Check in and simply ask, you know, how did this session go for you? Are you upset? Are you not? What feedback can you give? Did that feel fair? All of these important questions. Because at the end of the day, if your players are dissatisfied and you are dissatisfied, that kills the fun, that reduces the chance that another game gets scheduled, that more playtime happens, and that more importantly, that everybody comes back and has fun next week. As DMs, we really have to consider these ending check-ins to make sure that everyone is in fact okay, particularly after a situation like this. All right, y'all, so that's it. You've seen the 10 steps. You now know the situation that kind of made me really codify and think about these steps, particularly in terms of the trapper. So let me know if there's anything you would do differently, anything that you'd like to hear about in the future as well. And I will see you next week with yet another video. I hope this one helps. Bye now.